Hi everyone. In today's lecture, we're and food resources. So first we're going to start off with a discussion of different types of food problems around the world. We'll talk about some of the challenges of modern agriculture and how we can keep up with increasing demand. And then we'll also talk through some of those solutions to agricultural problems. So first of all, let's talk about world hunger. So it doesn't get nearly as much PR as it used to, but it's important to note that even though we have been able to dramatically increase uh, crop yields, which means we can grow more food on less land now than we have been at any other time in history, it's still not quite enough to keep up with global demand. And again, part of that global demand is the fact that our population continues to grow larger and larger and larger. I will also mention just briefly here that a lot of hunger problems are not necessarily related to the amount of food we're raising. Um, as a matter of fact, um, we've been essentially able to, to keep pace, if you will, um, when it comes to the amount of food we're growing. The problem really lies in distribution. Um, the places where we see um, people who are suffering from malnutrition, which means that they don't get enough to eat, um, are places that um, are not receiving food, not because it's not available, but because there are other problems. Sometimes those are political problems. Sometimes those are social problems. Um, it, there's a, a variety of different factors that go into play here, but it's important to note that hunger still continues to be a problem in lots of parts of the world. And again, it mostly comes down to distributing, getting the food that's available to the people who need it most. So this particular graphic here shows us that, again, in many places, especially in parts of um, southern and central Africa, in parts of Asia, even in parts of Central and South America, we still see uh, between somewhere uh, between, you know, 10 to, to over 35 percent of the population still doesn't have access to um, key nutrients that they need. So again, this can be undernourishment or malnourishment, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But that's not to say the areas that are in green are completely, um, that the entire population is well fed as well. Don't remember, forget, even here in the United States, we still have food insecurity problems. So people who are food insecure may not know where their next meal is coming from. The good news is, is that if you look at sort of the overall picture going back uh, 50 years ago to 1970, you can see that all countries have made improvements when it comes to um, the number and rate of malnourishment across the world. So the, the number of people that we're seeing who are still struggling with these problems is declining, right? So you can definitely see that these lines, and again, they've been coded for different parts, uh, different regions, but you can sort of follow the global line here, which is the dark black line here. We have seen improvements, and that's that's great. That's fantastic. We've made headway when it comes to that but there still is room here for more improvement. So there are about 86 countries that are considered uh, food deficient. Food deficient means that these countries cannot produce the food that they need. So uh, they have to bring food in otherwise. And typically these countries can't afford to import it. So because they also tend to be um, poor nations as well. So we know that hunger, population, poverty, and environmental problems are, are all interrelated with each other. Um, we know that the, the poorer a nation is, um, that we see um, typically larger um, fertility rates, again, for, for women, because, uh, again, you have problems with malnutrition and you have problems that children don't survive into adulthood. And so you typically have larger families to accommodate for that. Um, these also tend to be very rural areas where economic opportunities are very limited. And so there's not a lot uh, to do to bring in money and to earn income. So again, um, we have dramatically been able to increase the amount of food uh, we produce. So once again, just between um, 1970 and, and 1997, so a period of um, uh, you know 30-ish years, uh, we were able to double our grain production, and that's amazing that we could do that. Um, but again, the problem is is that 
the food that we are creating is not always getting to the places that need it the most. So I mentioned this before, this idea of food security. Not everybody is food secure. Food security is the ability to obtain uh, sufficient healthy food on a day-to-day -day basis. So the idea that you know where your next meal is coming from and you know that that meal contains the nutrients that you need. It contains um, fats and carbohydrates and protein and the things that you need uh, to live a healthy, productive life. So again, even in countries like he us here in the United States, we don't necessarily have 100% food security, right? There are still plenty of people who are worried about where their next meal comes from. And if they are able to afford something, is it going to be something that's going to be healthy or is it going to be very high fat, high salt, high sugar, unhealthy food? Um, so again, poorest countries, you have entire economies that can suffer dramatically based on um, as far as their food production goes, and it, it can be at the whim of the weather. So one drought, one flood, one massive insect outbreak, and their uh, food production for the entire year could be uh, destroyed. So this is a, a problem worldwide, food security. On the opposite side of this is another problem, which is overnutrition. So especially in developed countries, we often have a type of, this is still a type of malnutrition, we're eating too many things, right? It's not the fact that we don't have access to healthy, affordable food. It's the fact that um, millions of people are eating unhealthily and they're consuming far more calories, typically uh, calorie foods that are um, typically more dense, high fat foods, high sodium foods, foods with a lot of sugar in them. All of those calories add up and they lead to chronic problems. And those chronic problems can lead to a whole host of diseases. So high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, um, all of those in things increase uh, as obesity rates increase. And again, this is mostly a problem in highly developed nations. The, the money that we are ha have, we spend on things like quick, cheap, fast food, uh, and we don't necessarily get this the same amount of exercise, or we don't have um, jobs that keep us as active as other people in other countries do. All right, so those are, again, some of the some world again we're calling them world sort of food problems if you will so not enough food too much food right under nutrition over nutrition let's talk about different types of agriculture basically there's there's two types if you want to sort of break it down into something very basic we have industrialized agriculture and subsistence agriculture and again even within a industrialized agriculture there there is a little room for you know, a discussion here of uh, agribusinesses versus family farms. But again, the big idea here is that when you're talking about agriculture in highly developed countries, it typically requires a, a, a big amount of inputs. So you have uh, energy, you have land, you have water, um, all of these types of things that you need to, to grow, whatever it is you happen to be growing. And you're typically using what you grow not just to support your family, but you're selling it, right? So you're making money off of it. Maybe not a lot of money. <laughs> Farmers don't exactly rake it in by any means, but there is, um, but this is a, a job and a career and it's money to be made, hopefully, if they've had a good year. That is different than subsistence agriculture. Subsistence agriculture is the main agricultural model in lots of developing countries. And this is essentially you're just raising the food that you need for your family to live. Maybe if you have a little bit of extra, you can trade with a neighbor, um, or, or if it's been a, a good year, you, you put away more of that food and, and save it for, for next year if there are things that can be dried, or if you have other means of um, uh, um, preserving those foods. But this is not I'm making a living type of agriculture. This is I'm just trying to feed my family. So again, industrial agriculture or modern agriculture, however you want to look at it, has a lot of equipment. You use machines for a lot of things. You use machines for planting and weeding and harvesting and all kinds of things. You have seeds and fertilizers and watering and all of those types of things that go into this, right? Whereas the systems agriculture looks a lot different, okay? So you have um, either animals maybe that you're raising or you have your crops that you're raising, whatever it happens to be. Uh, and again, it's it's enough for your family or it might be enough uh, for your village in particular if you're in a very rural area. But this is, this is the way that you survive, not necessarily the way that you're making an income. 
So agriculture has lots of challenges. Um, one of the first challenges is that in the, almost all places, the amount of pro farmland we have is decreasing. So we're taking farmland and we're turning it into other things. We are turning it into homes and businesses and shopping centers and playgrounds and whatever it happens to be, right? That's that's called development. So as we develop the land that's available for us to develop tends to be land that we previously used to farm on. Um, so farms are um, definitely victims of, of urbanization and so suburban sprawl. So again, as human developments move outward, we continue to lose more and more farmland. That's extremely evident here in Illinois. Uh, if you go uh, south on uh, 55 or 57, or you go um, west on uh, 90 or, or 88, or even Interstate 80, you will get to the outskirts of uh, suburban Metro Chicago and you will almost immediately hit farmland, right? So we have a, a kind of a very distinct line between where suburbia ends and where farming, which is what primarily the most state of Illinois, um, that's uh, basically what we are. We're an agricultural state. And so as our settlements move further west and further south, we're continuing to use up more and more of that farmland. And again, it looks very much like this. Well, you'll have housing developments abut prime farmland. The good news is, is that we have been able to increase crop yields. So even though we have less land, we're able to... Um, grow crops that are more compact, that create uh, higher yields. Okay, so higher yields means you can you can make a plant and sort of make it very um, dense, that it has lots of seed heads on it. So we can have lots of whatever, lots of rice grains or wheat or corn ears or whatever it happens to be. Um, so, so we've been able to do that. So again, if you look at yields in, in bushels per acre, this number has essentially continued to go um, up every year. And it's got in large part because of the, the different varieties that we've been breeding. We've been taking plants that, again, have sort of very few seed heads. We're making them compact and more dense. Um, and we're, or we're getting more out of each plant. We can also... Um, look at how animals have been impacted um, and, and raising meat, if you will. So in addition to um, higher yields for plants, we also have higher meat production. Um, so there's more meat available at a less, less of a cost than there has been traditionally. And again, there's different ways that we've been able to do this. Some ways include things that uh, are like uh, using hormones uh, to promote growth, especially in uh, cattle in particular. This is a, a popular way to get cows to grow more quickly so we can bring them to slaughter is to, to use hormones. Um, antibiotics um, are also something that is, is used, especially in these big agribusinesses where you have um, uh, huge numbers of animals in, in very small confined areas. What we do is we Farmers typically will feed their um, animals antibiotics so that they, they don't get sick, so that they can gain weight and there's less disease going on. And I, it's not everyone who does this, by the way. This is this is common in your big agribusinesses, but this is a lot less common in your small family farms. They, they typically don't do this. Um, meat production is, is kind of a sign of, of wealth and, and actually... The, the amount of meat that is available now um, has led to an increase in consumption in, in countries that typically you didn't have a lot of meat being consumed. But again, as people have more money, they spend things on, they spend money things on um, like food, for example. And so if you can afford to have that beef now, or you can afford to have that pork now where you couldn't necessarily before. So we've seen global meat production double in the last 45 years. And again, it's a sign of wealth because it's very expensive in terms of production to produce meat. So meat and dairy consumption's quadrupled in the last 40 years. This is sort of an interesting conundrum because it takes an awful lot of grain to raise meat versus using grains for other things. So you can take a grain of wheat, for example, and, and make, um, excuse me, a kilogram of grain uh, and make um, bread, for example. It doesn't take much to make bread, right? Um, you could use that feed and turn it into fish, okay? So for equal weight, this is how much fish you would get. It'd take one and a half kilograms just to produce the same amount of fish. 
it takes two kilograms just to produce the same amount of chicken. So again, you get the idea here. Um, and it takes eight kilograms just for that beef to make the same amount of beef. So it's raising animals is um, a high inputs of, of resources. So you need, again, you need a lot of resources to do that. The other problem from an environmental standpoint is these large agribusinesses are creating um, these constant, these confined animal feeding operations. We call them CAFOs. It's a great big warehouse or a concrete pen or whatever you'd like to look at it. And you just put as many animals on as possible as you can there. And there's really not very much room to move. And all they're doing is being fattened up. Uh, and then so that they can then be, um, they can go to slaughter. Uh, and so it, it's led to a whole host of uh, problems, especially when it comes to uh, this huge amounts of waste uh, that are created by these CAFOs. Um, those wastes are supposed to be kept on site um, at the facilities themselves, but often all of the manure um, has been known to leak. It's been known to leak into local groundwater supplies. It's been known to cause um, air quality problems in the sense of just the general smell of this many animals in, in such a small confined area. Um, places in North Carolina in particular with a lot of mega hog farms have, have had uh, residents complain and property values have gone down um, from the increased use of, of that type of um, animal operation. So lots of challenges facing agriculture. It is not easy to be a farmer. Um, but also it's not easy to balance the needs of growing food for people with the impact on the environment. So a lot of these are environmental impacts right here that we see from modern agriculture. So pesticides that are sprayed on the ground, they, they become residues in the air sometimes. Again, odors from livestock factories. We have water issues, just like I mentioned before. Remember, 70% of all your freshwater withdrawals go to growing um, to, to agriculture. That's what they go to. So keep in mind that we're using a huge amount of water in order to, to keep these crops uh, going. So we also have, uh, again, pollution from fertilizer and pesticide runoff, and then um, land degradation. So depending on what happens to a field at the end of the season, if the field is just the soil is out in the open and it's, it's not, you don't plant any cover on it, what happens is that soil can be blown or washed away. And, and soil is a technically a renewable resource. <laughs> but I say technically because it, it does take like tens of thousands of years to, to create new soil. So you can make new soil, but it takes a really, really long time. So it's better just to protect and preserve what we have. All right. So what can we do? One idea is moving to sustainable agriculture. And I would say that this is probably a, a model that more small family farms are using, um, not necessarily the big agribusinesses, but this is sort of your local farmer. So if you've gone to a farmer's market or you you belong to a, a CSA, which is community supported agriculture, these are your small local farmers. And this is basically what they're doing. This is kind of their model. Um, they're doing modern techniques and traditional techniques, right? So they've got different varieties of plants and they grow lots of different things and they are rotating crops and they're concerned about water and energy and they're trying to preserve their soil quality. They're doing all of these things to protect and maintain their farm. Um, local farmers are, are very passionate about what they do and, and, they, and they want people to enjoy the food that they're bringing to them and they want them to understand that they sort of have this, this, this approach that really is not only good for the food that they're growing, but also good for the farms and the farmers themselves. So this could be what a sustainable farm looks like. Again, just kind of depends on what's being grown. Um, but you can sort of look over that graphic and see all the different things that, again, these sort of um, smaller, more sustainable farms can do. Um, another key part of this is genetic engineering. So uh, genetic engineering is essentially taking a trait from something that's not a plant like bacterial resistance and you engineer it into the plant cells themselves and we don't have quite enough time to go into the the science behind this um, but you really can um, sort of learn more about it and what it enables us to do is it enables us to give traits to plants that plants normally wouldn't have so we can make corn resistant 
to corn borers, which is a, a type of insect that eats corn leaves, we can make them resistant by engineering a bacterium, um, a bacterial gene inside of them uh, called the Bt gene. And the Bt gene produces a, a natural uh, toxic chemical that the corn borers don't like. So they don't eat the plants anymore. So what happens is, is then you have a insect resistant plant without having to spread pesticides on it, for example. So uh, pests are any organism that interferes in some way with human welfare or activity. Typically we deal with pests by spraying them with pesticides. So we have insecticides, herbicides, rodenticides, fungicides. So again, insecticides are for insects, herbicides are for uh, weeds, Rodenticides are for rats and fungicides are for different types of fungus. So we use all kinds of pesticides to, to sort of get, is, they're a large part of agriculture and modern agriculture. Um, we've been able to eliminate all kinds of diseases with them. So, so pesticides aren't necessarily a bad thing. Um, we have increased our crop yields um, because we know that pests are a major destruction of crops. Um, however, it takes more than just pesticides to make a difference. So. Unfortunately, most pesticides are kill everything, <laughs> including the things that we want around. So not all bugs are bad bugs, just a certain few bugs. But unfortunately, most pesticides kill everything. And they also move around in our air and our water, and they can contaminate things. So the problem is, is that we need other ways of controlling pests, not just spraying them with something. So this is a nice table that sort of goes through a whole host of things that, that could be done. And typically what we call all these tools is we refer to them as integrated pest management. And again, lots of your local farmers um, and, and small farmers, this is what they're doing. Yes, they're using some pesticides, but they're also doing other things. They're using something like pheromone traps to uh, attract insects. They're being very careful about uh, what they plant and when they plant things, and they're um, trying to plant resistant crop varieties. And so, uh, again, the idea here is that you can greatly reduce the impact that something like wide use of pesticides has on the air and the water and the land by just using some different tools that they have at their disposal.